Okay, in chapter 10, we are going to compare two groups. And we're going to do hypothesis testing either on two means or two proportions. And we're going to look at paired data and we're going to look at data that's independent. So we need to be able to classify hypotheses by type. So looking at your problem, what type of hypothesis test do you want to conduct? And then we will conduct and interpret hypothesis and tests for two population means, population standard deviation unknown. So again, if we don't know the population standard deviation, what type of test do we use? G. Then we'll conduct and interpret hypothesis tests for two population proportions. And we'll conduct and interpret hypotheses tests for matched or paired samples. Now you might have noticed that in your homework, it's out of sequence. We do 10-1 and 10-4 first, and then we do 10-3. And I'm not sure why that was arranged that way, but that's the way we're gonna do it. Okay, so if you want to test a claim that involves two groups, the types of breakfast eaten east and west of the Mississippi River, you can use a slightly different technique when conducting a hypothesis test, or slight, slightly different than what we've used prior to today. Okay, so studies often compare two groups. For example, researchers are interested in the effect aspirin has on preventing heart attacks. Over the last few years, newspapers and magazines have reported various aspirin studies involving two groups. Typically, one group is given aspirin and the other group is given a placebo. What's a placebo? What's that? I can't hear you. Sugar pill. That, that's perfect perfect description of it because <laughs> it very white melt well may contain sugar. It's a pill that looks just like the aspirin that someone else has given, but it doesn't have any active ingredients in it. So nothing that would actually affect your health. Um, then they study the heart attack rates over several years. There are other situations that deal with the comparison of two groups. For example, studies compare various diet and exercise programs, or politicians compare the proportion of individuals from different income brackets who might vote for them, or you may be interested in whether the SAT or the ACT or the GRE preparatory courses really help raise the scores of those exams. So we've learned so far to conduct hypothesis tests on single means and single proportions. We'll expand upon that in this chapter. We'll compare two means or two proportions to each other. The general procedure is still the same, just expanded. And you're going to appreciate your calculator in this section because the formulas for this are quite cumbersome. But we will do it first using those formulas so that you can appreciate what your calculator does for you. To compare two means or two proportions, you work with two groups. The groups are classified as either independent or matched pairs. Independent groups consist of two samples that are independent. That is sample values selected from one population are not related in any way to sample values selected from the other population. Matched pairs consist of two samples that are dependent. The parameter tested using matched pairs is the population mean. So if you're comparing matched pairs, you will be looking at population mean. 
The parameters tested using independent groups are either population means or population proportions. So we deal with two different types of groups, independent groups. We can use a test of population means or the test of population proportions, but matched or paired samples where the samples are dependent, we would use two population proportions by testing one population mean of differences. We'll talk about that on Thursday. Okay, so what makes two samples independent? Subjects in one group do not provide information about subjects in other groups. Each group contains different subjects and there's no meaningful way to pair them. Independent groups are more common in hypothesis testing. For example, a medication trial has a control group and a treatment group that contain different subjects. A study assesses the strength of a part made from different alloys. Each alloy sample contains different parts. Uh, studies that use independent samples estimate between subject effects. These effects are the difference between group, the groups, such as the mean difference. For example, in the medication study, the effect is the mean difference between the treatment and the control groups. The focus is on comparing group properties rather than individuals. The sample size for this type of study is the total number of subjects in all the groups. The difference between independent and dependent in dependent sample subjects in one group do provide information about subjects in other groups. The group either contains the same set of subjects, like a before and after, or different subjects that the analyst have paired meaningfully. Groups are frequently dependent because they contain the exact same subjects. That's the most common example. However, that's not always the case. Groups with different subjects can be dependent samples if the subjects in one group provide information about the subjects in the other group. For example, statisticians often consider different samples that include pairs of siblings to be dependent because one sibling can provide information about another sibling for some measurements. Um, you know, like in my family, we siblings all uh, share hypertension. Isn't that a wonderful thing to share? But we all have it. Other studies use matched pairs. In these studies, researchers deliberately pair subjects with very similar characteristics. While matched pairs are different people, the statistical analysis treats them as the same person because they're intentionally very similar. For example, the following studies use dependent samples. A training program assessment takes pretest and post-test scores from the same group of people. A paint durability study applies different types of paint to proportion of the same wooden boards. All paint types on the same board are considered pairs. Studies that use dependent samples estimate within subject effects. These effects are the difference between paired subjects such as the subject's mean chain. For example, the training program assessment it estimates the mean change for subjects from the pretest to the post-test. The emphasis is on the difference between paired subjects. The sample size for this type of study is the number of pairs. Terms such as paired, repeated measurements within subject effects, match pairs, pretest, post-test, indicate that groups are dependent. All right, so now we are finally in section 10.1. That was all introduction to this chapter. So what are we going to do in 10.1? We're going to look at two independent samples or simple random samples from two, di two distinct populations. For the two distinct populations, if the samples are small, the distributions are important, they should be normal. If the sample sizes are large, the distributions are not important. So we're going to look at two population means with unknown standard deviations. They should be independent samples. 
And if the sample size that we have is small, we need to know that the underlying distribution is normal. If the sample sizes are large, we don't care. Normally, that magic number for a large sample size is 30. So we're going to compare two population means. The comparison of two population means is very common. A difference between two samples depends on both the means and the standard deviations. Very different means can occur by chance if there's a great variation among the individual samples. In order to account for the variation, we take the difference in the sample means x sub one bar minus x sub two bar and divide by the standard error in order to standardize the difference. So when we talk about a single sample mean to standardize it, we take it from the population mean and divide by the standard deviation. Now we're going to look at the difference in the sample means and we're going to divide it by this thing called the standard error to standardize it. <laughs> and the result is a T score test statistic. So our random variable, we haven't talked about those in a while. The random variable that we are interested in is then the difference in the sample means. Because we do not know the population standard deviation, you got to love this formula here, we estimate them using the two sample standard deviations from our independent samples. For the hypothesis test, we calculated the estimated standard deviation or standard error of the difference in sample means x sub one bar minus x sub two bar. The standard error is given by the square root of the standard deviation of your first sample squared divided by the number in that sample plus the standard deviation of your second sample squared divided by the number in that sample. So to find your t-statistic, we're going to take the difference in the means and we're going to divide it by that standard error. Then once you know your t-statistic, you can go in and find the area under the curve, which is your p-value, and you can conduct your hypothesis test. So the test statistic, the t-score is calculated as follows. x sub 1 bar minus x sub 2 bar minus mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 divided by that standard error. Don't you want to calculate that? No, because we're going like, to use our calculator. Okay, you're going to love the degrees of freedom. Remember, a t-test has to have degrees of freedom. You need to know what the sample size is minus one. That's the degrees of freedom in a single mean t-value, t-test. The number of degrees of freedom requires a somewhat complicated calculation. Somewhat is an understatement. However, a computer or calculator, and your calculator can find this quite easily. Uh, calculates it easily. The degrees of freedom is not always a whole number. The test statistic calculated previously is approximated by the student's t distribution with their degrees of freedom as follows. So s sub 1 is the standard deviation of your first sample. n sub 1 is the size of your first sample. s sub 2 is the standard deviation of your second sample. n sub 2 is the size of your second sample. Now, something called pooled variance, and when you go into your calculator and you conduct this t-test, you're going to see that it's going to ask you if you want to pool it or not. Pooled variance, also called combined, composite, or overall variance, is a way to estimate common variance when you believe that the different populations have the same variances, so approximately the same standard deviation. So to find the pooled variance, you take n, which is the sample size of the first sample, minus 1 times its standard deviation squared, plus n, which is the sample size of your second 
sample minus one times the standard deviation of your second sample squared, and then you add the two sample sizes and subtract two, and you divide that into the numerator. <laughs> That's how you find pool variance. And you use this when you think that the variances from the two populations are approximately equal. So you, if you believe the population variances are the same, one way to check is to look at the ratio of your sample standard deviations. If that's close to one, you can probably use a pooled variance. Um, and this is really just a choice in your calculator, whether you choose to use pooled variance or not. It's a judgment call. But in general, a ratio of 0.5 to, to 3 is a reasonable indication that the variances are close enough. OK, let's do an example, finally. We're going to do this old school, then we'll do it using the calculator test. The average amount of time boys and girls age 7 to 11 spend playing sports each day is believed to be the same. A study is done and data are collected, resulting in the data in table 10.1. Each population's each population has a normal distribution. Is there a difference in the mean amount of time boys and girls age 7 to 11 play sports each day. The test we're going to conduct is at a 5% level of significance. So what we have here is we took a sample of nine girls. On average, they played two hours of sports per day. So the average of our sample of girls is two, the standard deviation was 0.866. We took a sample of 16 boys. On average, they played 3.2 hours of sports each day. The standard deviation of the sample of boys was one. Okay, so since the population standard deviation is not known, we are going to use a t-test, and we're going to use the subscripts G for girls and B for boys. So mu sub G is the population mean for girls, and mu sub B is the population mean for boys. And this is a test of two independent groups, two population means. So how do we form our null and our alternative hypothesis. So the original statement in our problem says, the average amount of time boys and girls age seven to 11 spend playing sports each day is believed to be the same. So they conducted the test to see if that's true. So what's our null hypothesis? That the mean time that girls and boys play sports are the same. So your null hypothesis is the mean time that girls play equals the mean time that boys play. Now you could also write this since we were talking earlier that we look at differences, that the differences in the average hours that girls play minus the average hours that boys play is zero. There is no difference in the means. So if that's the null hypothesis, what's the alternative hypothesis? Spit it out. You're not. Don't think about it. Too much. 
if the all, null is equals, what, what is the alternative? So they're not the same. Okay, so now that we have our hypotheses written, we're going to go in and find the t score. And we are then going to calculate. It's going to be it's it's difficult. I don't even know if I want to show you, but we're going to we're going to do it. Okay. So here's our formula. I'm already getting tired just looking at it, just writing it. Okay, now the assumption is we don't know anything about the population means, but our assumption is that they're the same. That's what we're trying to test. So mu sub B minus mu sub G is zero, okay? So what did we have for the mean for boys? Was that 3.2 minus the mean for girls, which was what, two? Divided by the standard deviation for the boys was one. Divided by, we had what, 16 in the sample. The standard deviation for the girls was 0.866. Divided by the sample size was nine. So we take our handy dandy calculator out, we take 3.2 minus two and divide it by that square root. And I get approximately 3.14. Does anybody need a calculator today? Because I've got my two up here. So that's our T-score. Our T-score is 3.14. Okay, so now that I know what T is, I can go in and find the P value by finding the area underneath the curve. Now this is a two-tailed test because our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis contained equals and not equals. So this is a two-tailed test. So half of our p-value is in each tail. And this z-score is 3.14. So this one over here would be negative 3.14. That's the way the t-distribution works. Okay, so now we need to find the area under the curve. That's going to give us half our p value. So we have half a p here and half of it here. Okay, so where do we do that? That's that what? In TCDF, where you find the area of the curve. So it would be second, find your distribution menu. and find the TCDF. So we're gonna have a lower limit of a really small number. Our upper limit is going to be the negative 3.14. I could have done this the other way. I could have had my lower limit be 3.14 and my upper limit be one times 10 to the 99, 
I just need to find the area in one tail or the other. Um, so what do we get? And the degrees of freedom, which I have to calculate. Oh, dadgummit, I have to calculate that. <laughs> I don't wanna. Okay, how do you calculate the degrees of freedom? Well, that is the standard deviation of the boys squared over the size of the sample plus the standard deviation of the girls squared divided by the size of that sample squared over one minus n sub b minus one times s sub b squared over n sub b squared. Are you tired yet? One plus ng minus one times s g squared over into that is squared. Okay, I did that for you. Aren't you glad? That is approximately 18.8462. I did that calculation for you. It ain't pretty. Okay, so what do you get? If I do um, a T distribution and I find the area under the curve from negative really small number to negative 3.14 with degrees of freedom of 18.8462, I get the area under the curve to be 0 0.002715 or 0 0.0028. So in each tail, you've got 0 0.0028. So the p-value is twice that. which is 0 0.00543. Okay, all that work just to find the p-value. Now what do you do? Don't you love it when they spoof people's phone numbers? Some poor slob in St. Louis, Oklahoma. You know where St. Louis, Oklahoma is? Did you know we have a St. Louis, Oklahoma? I'm sure it's just some poor slob that lives in that little town, their numbers being spoofed. But anyway, so now once we find the p-value, we can finish up our hypothesis test. So you look at your p-value. Now, what was our significance level? Um, we stated that, didn't we? A 5% level of significance. So we need to compare our p-value How am I calling them? I don't know how I did that. Yeah. Get that in my pocket. Where am I? Okay, so we're gonna compare our p-value. To alpha, which we set at 0.05. So since our p-value is less than alpha, if the p is low, then the null must go. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis that the mean number of hours that girls play sports is the same as boys. So they're not the same. Now, I'm not going to conclude that one is more than the other, but the data that I took supports the uh, conclusion that boys and girls do not play the same number of hours of sports per day. So since alpha is greater than P, we reject the null hypothesis. That means you reject that the mean number of hours girls play is the same number as boys. The means are different. All right. Are you writing that down? You want to see the easy way to do this? Yes, you do. Let's go back to our example where we have the means of our samples and the standard deviations of our samples, and we know our sample sizes. So that's what we need to know. Mean, standard deviation, and the size of each sample. We're going to go to our calculator. 
Okay, and we're going to go to stat and we're going to go to tests. And in our stat test, we have number four is a two sample t test. And that's what we've done. We've got a set of two samples. We don't know the population standard deviation. So we're going to conduct a t test. So we're going to do number four. Okay, now, again, you have a choice. You can use data that you input. So if you have the raw data for these two samples, you could input that data and list in your in your calculator. I don't have data. So I'm going to go to stats and hit enter. Okay. So I've got other information in there. So I'm going to go in and input each one of these pieces of information that I got. Okay, so I'm going to let X1 be 2, the mean of the girls. And what was their standard deviation? 0.866. And how many did I have in that sample? Were there nine in that sample? So there's the girls' information. So what was the boys' information? That it was 3.2 hours per day on average. Their standard deviation was one. And did we sample 16 boys? Okay, so now you need to decide the comparison of your two means. So how are you comparing mu1 and mu2? Well, our alternative hypothesis was that mu1 and mu2 boys and girls was what? Not equal to. So we're going to choose not equal to. And I didn't pull the variances. So I'm going to leave no selected. The arrow down. And find my calculate. And there we go. So is this the same information we got from doing all that calculation? And the answer is yes. It's exactly the same information. The T score is negative 3.14. The way I did it in the example, it was positive 3.14. I don't care. So it says it's two tailed. I'm going to have T at negative 3.14 and positive 3.14. And I have the area and the two tails. The area and the two tails combined is the P value. That's 0 0.0054. The degrees of freedom for this example is 18.8466. The mean, et cetera, et cetera. So now, since we have the p-value, and I can arrow down and see the rest of this information where they give me the sample size. So now that I know the p-value, again, the p-value is 0 0.005. That is less than the alpha that I chose to do this test. That's less than 0.05. So since the p-value is less than alpha, I reject the null hypothesis that the two means are the same. So from now on, I'm going to use this test. I'm not going to go through and find this t-score the area under the curve, the, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Um, just a note, when the sum of the sample sizes is larger than 30, so n plus, uh, sub 1 plus n sub 2 is greater than 30. You can use the normal distribution to approximate the student's team. OK, let's look at another example. A study is done by a community group in two neighboring colleges to determine which one graduates students with more math classes. College A samples 11 graduates. Their average is four math classes 
with a standard deviation of 1.5 math classes. College B samples nine graduates. Their average is three and a half math classes with a standard deviation of one math class. The community group believes that a student who graduates from college A has taken more math classes on average than the college B. Both populations have a normal distribution, test at a 1% significance level, answer the following questions. A, is this a test of two means or two proportions? What is it? Is this a test of two means or two proportions? Do you know the population standard deviation? Is it stated anywhere in here? So what distribution are you going to use? You're ahead of me. Okay, so what's the random variable? So the random variable is the difference in the two means. Since you're talking about comparing two means, the random variable for this hypothesis test is the difference in the two means from college A to college B. Okay. So now we need to write the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, and conduct the test. Conducting the test is a simple matter of plugging it into your calculator. Okay, so what are our alt null and alternate hypothesis? So what do they say? One, two, 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 two. A community group believes, right here, that a student who graduates from college A has taken more math classes on the average. So their claim is that the average from college A is bigger than the average from column B, uh, college B. So what hypothesis is that? Is that the alternative or the null? And it's the alternative because the alternative hypothesis never has an equal. So if it's greater than, less than, or not equal to, that's the alternative. So what would the null hypothesis be then? Whatever the opposite is. Okay. So now I'm going to go conduct my test. So I'm going to go to my stat menu, tests. I'm going to do a two sample t test, number four. And I'm going to input my stats. So what do we have here? So let's let x1 be college A. So on average, College A students took what? Four math classes with a standard deviation of one and a half. The sample size of that sample was 11. How about College B? What did they, on average, three and a half? Um, the standard deviation was one, and they looked at nine students. Okay, now I need to change my uh, test. This is a left tailed test because we're looking at greater than, and I want mu1 is greater than mu2. 
So I need to go over. The first mean is greater than the second mean. I'm not going to pool my variances right now, and I'm going to calculate. So what do we get? Our T statistic is 0.8899. My P value, which is probably the thing that I'm most interested in, my P value is very big, 0.1928. And you can look at the rest of the data, the degrees of freedom, 17.3978, et cetera. But what I'm interested in is that p-value. Because if that p-value is high, which it is, I can't reject the null hypothesis. So I fail to reject the null hypothesis. So my p-value that I calculated was 0.1928 compared to alpha, which is 0.01, significance. So if the p is high, the null is, must fly. So we are going to fail to reject. So what that means is that the evidence doesn't support what they believe that college A graduates students who've taken more math classes than college B. So at a 1% level of significance from the sample data, there's not sufficient evidence to conclude that a student who graduates from college A has taken more math classes on the average than a student who graduates from college B. All right. A professor at a large community college wanted to determine whether there is a difference in the means of final exam scores between students who took his face-to-face -face statistics class. He believed that the mean of the final exam scored for the online class would be lower than that of the face-to-face -face class. Was the professor correct? The randomly selected 30 final exam scores from each group are listed in the next two tables. So he looked at his two classes. He's comparing the online class, which is this set of data, with his face-to-face -face class. And he's going to determine whether there's a difference or not. And what he's mostly interested in is is the online class average less than the face-to-face. -face. And you want to put this in? I will let you put this in if you want to put this in your calculator to see how this works. Um, I put the online data in L1 and the face-to-face -face data in L2. And there are 30 values in each table. And if you want to put that in, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Anybody need a calculator if they want to do it? And this is typical of what you would be doing as a statistician. You would have the data, the raw data, and you'd be putting that into either a computer or a calculator to, to conduct the hypothesis test. <clears throat> 
I hope you're texting and not using those calculator, those phones to answer questions. If you're using your phone to answer questions, that's a bad thing. If you're using it to text while you're in class, that's not a good thing either. It's better than using it to answer questions. Got it? All right. So obviously the difference in conducting the test is going to be what you tell your calculator to use. You're not gonna tell your calculator to use the stats that you input. You're going to tell your calculator to use the data that you've inputted. So I'm gonna to go to stats, test, Number four, to sample t-test. And now I'm going to go over to data and I'm gonna highlight that. Now I put my data in L1 and L2 and I don't have any frequency tables. So I'm gonna, the frequency for each one of these data values is one. And what kind of test am I conducting? So I need to decide down here. So I didn't really think if I wrote, did I ever write that down? Well, let's go back there and write that down. So this is a test of two means because he's interested in looking at the average of his two classes. No, I don't know the standard deviation of the population. So I'm gonna do a t-test. My random variable is the difference in his online class and his face-to-face. -face. So it's the difference in the means of those two classes. And my null hypothesis and my alternate hypothesis would be what? Well, he thinks that the face-to-face -face class um, scores better than the online class. And I do need to make sure that I have this in the correct order from what I put into my calculator. So I put L1, that's my online data. So I need to make sure that L1, the data in L1 is less than the data in L2. So the null hypothesis would be that they're either not different or they're the same or that the online class scores better. So you could make this greater than or equal to, or it could just be equals, that there's no difference in the two, okay? So let's go back now that I have this written. So I want mu one to be less than mu two. So mu one is being calculated from that first list. So he thinks that the online data will show that the mean is less than the face-to-face. -face. Okay, let's calculate this. We're not gonna pool. And here's what we get. So what's our p-value? Our p-value is 0 0.001. And that's really all I'm interested in at this point. Okay, this was left tailed because our alternative hypothesis was 
that the online class scores less than the face-to-face -face class, so that makes it left-tailed. P-value, what did we calculate? 0 0.0011. So what do we do? Alpha is 0 0.05. That is the level of significance that we choose. So what? If the P is low, the null must go. So are we rejecting the null? We are. So the sample data supports the claim that the online final average is less than the average for the face-to-face -face class. So at the O5 significant level, from the sample data, there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the face-to-face -face class averages higher on the final than the online class. And you know this, we always draw the conclusion that the data that we've taken, the sample data, is what supports our conclusion. Okay. The professor was correct. The evidence shows that the mean of the final exam scores for the online class is lower than that of the face-to-face -face class. At a 5% level of significance from the sample data, there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean of the final scores for the online class is less than the mean of the final exam scores of the face-to-face -face class. Okay. Another way that you can look at the comparison of the means is to look at this thing called the Cohen standard for small, medium, and large effect sizes. Cohen's D is a measure of effect size based on differences between two means. Cohen's D is named for United States statistician Jacob Cohen, and it measures the relative strength of the differences between the means of two populations based on the sample data. The calculated value of effect size is then compared to Cohen's standard of small, medium, or large effect sizes. And what he came up with is that there's a small effect if D is around 0.2, a medium if it's 0.5, and large if it's 0.8. And the way you calculate this thing is here. You take the difference in their means, so the difference in the sample means, and you divide it by the pooled standard deviation, where you have to calculate, no, you don't, you're going to let your calculator calculate it, where the pooled standard deviation is given by the square root of the pooled variance, where you use this formula to calculate the pooled standard deviation. And it's really not all that complicated of a calculation. You take the sample size of the first sample, you subtract one, that's the number of degrees of freedom. You multiply that by the variance or the standard deviation squared of your first sample. Then you add the sample size or the degrees of freedom of your second sample times the standard deviation squared of the second sample. And then you divide it by the degrees of freedom, total degrees of freedom, which is the size of each sample added and you subtract two. It's really not all that complicated. Okay, so we're going to calculate Cohen's D for the example that we did 10.2. And then we're going to look at the size of the effect. Is it small, medium, or large? And then we're gonna explain what that size of the effect means for this problem. 
So in example two, we were looking at the two colleges. So college A, which I can spell college. You know, if you're a college teacher, you should be able to spell college. So college A, we had what? That the mean was for the standard deviation. was one and a half and the sample size was 11. And for college B, um, we had what, was it three and a half? One and the sample size was nine. So you can just, instead of, I mean, you can do the calculation. You can plug all this into that calculation or you can let your calculator calculate the pooled standard deviation for you. So what you do, go back to your calculator and you conduct the test again, but now you're gonna pool the data, pool the standard deviations. So we're gonna go back to our tests. Number four, we're gonna use our stats. And we're going to type that in. We had four. Maybe easier to do the calculation than type all this back in. What was that? 11. So this is one of those things while you're doing the problem, you might just note. You might do it twice and note what the pooled standard deviation is. Uh, what did we get? One. And nine. And now what was my, it was greater than, wasn't it? So I need to change that to greater than. And yes, I'm going to pool the standard deviations. So the only difference is I select a yes for pooled and then calculate. Okay. So my pooled standard deviation, if I arrow down, it's S sub XP. That's the pooled standard deviation. And it's 1.30170.8279. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna divide that into the difference of the averages of the two samples. So to calculate the Cohen's D, I take the difference in the two samples, means, and I divide by that pooled standard deviation. And I get 0.384, which is between small and medium. So the effect of the difference is somewhere between small and medium. And what did we do in section on that problem? Since the effect is small, then we didn't reject the null hypothesis. So if the effect that you calculate is small, medium, you're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. It's not significant enough for me to say there's a difference. So it indicates there's not a significant difference between those two means. Okay, how about for 10.3? Okay, so for 10.3 is the data that we just looked at for the online versus the face-to-face. Um, -face. And if I pool that data, I get that S sub P is 14.551053.
So D is the difference in the means. So you would need to calculate the means. I think it does give you the mean, doesn't it? Can't even remember what I just looked at two seconds ago. Let's go back to our calculators. And let's go to stat tests for, let's use the data. Okay, L1, L2. Um, our hypothesis test was less than, wasn't it? So make sure we get less than. We're going to pool it this time. We're going to calculate it. And it does, it gives me the averages. The average for the online class was 72. The average for the face-to-face -face class was 84.98. And the pooled standard deviation is the 14.5510534. So we're going to take the difference in those two means and divide it by that pooled standard deviation. So we're going to take the difference in those means. And I get 0.834. And that's large. So there is a significant difference in the means. So he was, the sample data supports his conclusion that uh, the face to face class is significantly higher than the online class. And I actually finished that. I'm amazed. I actually finished the first section early. I'm amazed. Okay. So I'm not going to change, I'm going to go ahead and change the due dates like I promised you at the beginning of class. I'll go do that here just, just now. And on Thursday, we'll pick up and we'll talk about section 10.4 on matched data. So everything we looked at in 10.1 were independent samples. The two samples are no way, shape or form related to each other. Okay. All right. Have a great rest of your day.